I know a lot of you guys are out there uh, working on your bridges still and cleaning up. So I'm just going to hopefully be able to inspire you a little bit about why bridges are important. And it's not only for being able to become, as Milton said, you know, structurally proficient and getting your efficiency ratios down and up, up other, uh, but like, how can you actually make beautiful structures and how can you make structures that change the lives of people around the world? So I graduated college and this was my office sitting on rural infrastructure in the middle of Nicaragua. And, you know, I think a lot of people say, well, Avery, how did you get that job? And like many of you, I was an aspiring engineer. And, but I kind of imagined, well, I don't know, maybe I'm going to be in front of a computer a lot. Maybe I'm going to be using a calculator a lot, which I do. But I also have the opportunity to actually go out and touch, feel, and build the things that I design. And I think that that's one of the things that I love most about my career in engineering. So I wanted to share a little bit about my story today in hopes that maybe I could speak to a few of you um, to maybe become bridge engineers, um, or at least just to consider all of the worlds of opportunity that the STEM fields open uh, to you. So this will date me a little bit. I'm quite a bit older than all of you, but um, Legos were also popular in the 19, early 1980s. And I remember thinking like, wow, I like to tinker with things. And you know, this is really before robotics got big. and so. Most of my friends would just like sit there and build castles or houses or, or, or bridges in this case. And so as I started to think about what it was that I wanted to do in school, I was like, well, I also love to be creative. And just like many of you, that last bridge I saw was really cool aesthetic with that architectural feature on the side. Kind of imagine maybe, you know, doing something artistic in school. But ultimately, got to kind of the, the deci decision point of what I was going to do. And I decided to play a collegiate sport. And so I'm not sure how many folks in the room are thinking about playing sports in college, but you have to kind of take all of these factors into play and decide like, where could I, what could I do next in my career that's going to set me up? And for me, I felt like um, having a scholarship was really a differentiator for my ability to afford to go to college. So I decided to go to the University of Iowa, play soccer and double major in engineering and art. But halfway through my college years, uh, much to my mom's chagrin, um, I decided to buy a one-way plane ticket uh, to the, a place in the middle of the South Pacific, which frankly, I had to look up on a map. Uh, I went to Fiji. Um, if I was in a room with all of you, I'd kind of ask who's been to Fiji or whose parents honeymooned in Fiji. You normally hear kind of a you know, smattering of, of kind of folks who all think of Fiji as a, you know, beautiful white sand beaches, really wealthy. Uh, but the reality is it's much like the rest of the South Pacific. There's a lot of nuance. There's both great wealth and an incredible poverty. So as I was in Fiji, I found something that I hope each of you find in your lifetime. And that was a deep passion, a passion to wake up every morning and be excited. And I did that because not laying on the sandy beaches and getting a tan or hanging out, having a cocktail because I was underage, uh, but actually doing something that gave back. It wasn't just about me. I didn't just want to go have a good long vacation study abroad. I wanted to help people. And how that came about was I was volunteering for the Breast Cancer Foundation. Now it's a, it's, you know, a little branch there in, in the, on the, in the islands. And every morning we would get our books and our bags and our translators and our packets. And we would, uh, we would want to go out and help all of these rural communities and all the women, in these rural communities understand the importance of breast cancer detection and early breast cancer detection. And so we would get to these rivers and after you've you know, driven for two hours and then you take a little tuk-tuk for another half hour, and then you walk for 30 minutes, you'd get to a river. And at that river, you'd decide, do I wanna risk my life today to go across that river to help these women learn about early breast cancer detection? Or do I turn around because it's too, too risky? And this is a picture of me the day I found my passion. It was the day I walked across just something so simple as a bridge. For those of us living in the United States, on average, we actually cross 27 bridges every single day. And so you almost don't think about it. You're going on an overpass. You're going on a, you know, a bike trail. You're going over to like a major, you know, I'm sitting here in San Francisco overlooking the Bay Bridge. Lots of different structures that are visible and not visible. But when you're living in a really rural area and there is no infrastructure, a bridge was a huge difference maker. And for me, it clicked. It was like, I could be passionate about helping people be connected, not about bridges, but about connection. 
And I, I like to say that at age 20, um, you know, my, my, where my world really opened up and began. I made the decision to go back to college. I'd left halfway through to study abroad. And so I flew home to the University of Iowa and got to work. I got to work talking to my professors, to my friends, to people in the community and talking about there is this huge need around the world where people can't cross rivers. And I convinced an organization called Bridges to Prosperity to let me go build a bridge with some of my closest classmates in college. This particular crossing you can see on the right is in the uh, highlands of the Peruvian mountains. So we're talking, if you fly into Lima, the capital, and you take another two hour flight to Cusco where Machu Picchu is located, drive six hours on the tops of windy mountains, and then you walk three hours into the kind of ravines and the, the crevices, you arrive at this community called Yavina. And in Yavina, every single year, when the water is low, like in this picture, all you do is you take all of the, essentially the vines that have been um, on, on the hillsides and, you, and they braid those vines. And as you can see, those vines get anchored on either side with a large mass, i.e. rocks, and kids cross those in order to get to school. Farmers cross those to go to markets. Women cross those to go to the doctor. But every single year when it rains, and we're talking not just one day, we're talking four or five, six months, of the year during the monsoon season, those braided vines get washed away. So imagine, here I am in the schoolyard and with the children in the dry season, having just watched all of these kids cross this bridge. Only half of those kids are going to be there for the other half of the year. And so the story of why bridges impact the lives of people around the world just clicked, and I ran with it. I built this bridge in Yavina, Peru and I found a sense of purpose. So anyone can be excited about a lot of stuff. You know, I think probably Milton and I are both excitable people, I bet. I don't know that for sure, but like I can get excited about playing soccer, I can get excited about my paintbrush, I can be excited about my Legos. But when I found something that was bigger than myself, that I was doing for other people, creating a sense of why to get up in the morning, it all changed. And that's something that I think STEM careers can do in spades, whether you're designing the brand new Apple Watch, like one of my mentees here in the Bay, or whether you're designing a bridge for a bunch of kids in rural Rwanda. There's a sense of purpose that I think engineers get to have that's really, really unique. And for me, that sense of purpose started to open my viewfinders. How big is this problem of rural isolation? It's big, guys. It's real big. We're talking communities in Pakistan, communities in Nigeria, communities in Colombia, communities in Indonesia, communities in Ethiopia. The ways that people get to school risk their lives every single day. And I had the opportunity to experience that firsthand right here in um, rural Ethiopia in Bahadar. 10,000 people live on the far side of this bridge right here. And what's interesting is bridges are so critical is that back in the 1400s, when the Portuguese actually, um, for any history and or geography buffs, here's a tangent for you. In the 1400s, the Portuguese built a series of bridges over the Nile, the Blue Nile in this case. And their multi-arch spans were built a little bit later by engineers. The binder is egg, which I think is so interesting. There was no such thing as cement at the time. So they use egg to make it cementitious, to make it connect all the rocks together. But anyhow, in the 1938, as the Italians came across Ethiopia and this entire community of Gondar saying, hey, don't come, we don't want you to invade. They got out there with their picks and their axles and they self-destructed that bridge that had been there since the 1400s when the Portuguese built it. Better to keep them out than for us to be able to get across. But the unintended consequence or maybe the known, the known consequence is like any piece of infrastructure that becomes critical it being gone is so much more obvious. So for, since 1938, the only way for 10,000 residents of Gondar to be able to get to primary school, which is beyond, or secondary school, which is beyond fourth grade, the only way to get to healthcare, the only way to get to the big regional center is to get six of your best friends on either side of a river, hold this rope. So if you cannot see this screen, go poke your head close to the screen because this is wild and have six of your friends Hold either side of that rope. 
just think about how terrifying it is if you cannot see that river how far down below and that is what kids do every single day women do when they need to have an emergency and get to the hospital when they're birthing a child that's what people do when farmers say i've got just a little bit extra i want to sell at the market and so when bridges prosperity came in and built this bridge i saw a couple of suspension bridges here today i'm really impressed they're much more technically challenging intellectually and uh, um, you know kind of psychologically but they are really efficient and so if you start to think about if you look in the lower left hand corner where that multi arch span we initially did a simple kind of crossing the year one we actually put a truss structure which i saw a lot today as well trusses are very efficient a series of triangles are probably the most efficient bridge structure but they're heavy but the reality was in this case the water has risen so much since the portuguese originally built this bridge that it now crests over the top of this bridge every single year and so something interesting about engineering is it's a dynamic set of problems you're constantly trying to solve for. So when the organization before me went in, they initially said, let's build the trust bridge. Let's, you know, essentially anchor it to the existing multi-arch span and we're gone. Then very next year, the water rises. The water has such incredible lateral force and lateral force just means force coming in this direction as opposed to a weight coming down direction that it ripped from the hinges and it washed away. And so what we were challenged as, as engineers, was then, what do we do? And the solution was a cable-supported structure that wasn't right there at the local um, area of fixing, but much further up into the canyon, to put it on either side of the canyon wall and to lift the load off, the, off of the, the, the floor. Um, really interesting, uh, but to this day, 10,000 people, residents of Gondar, the very same people who built this bridge with their very two hands are using it uh, to access all of the aforementioned services. Coming back to the point, it's all about the people. That film was not about how much cable tension was in that strand or how much weight was in the anchor or how big the walking surface was. That's the stuff that the engineers, we all talk about and think about every day. But the reality is whether we're designing something new for the space station, or we're designing something for people in rural Bolivia. We're all focused on people. And that's the thing that I feel like is maybe lost when we start talking about STEM fields and engineering in particular. We talk about proclivities for science, and interest in math, the you know, ability to solve problems. But there's also a huge people element. We're all helping people every single day. And like doctors, like nurses, like teachers, engineers has a, have a profound impact on the world and we're helping make the lives of everyone better even if they might not even know it and so i like to kind of bring this all together and just say imagine if you had to risk your life to just to seek opportunity to come to school today if it was a decision if you may or may not make it home tonight and i'd like to encourage you to think about there are one billion people on this planet that, that is their reality that is one in seven humans today cannot decide to go to school or not based on their ability to risk their life. Engineers have the capability to solve that problem. When you build bridges, kids go to school, you get and get jobs, farmers are more profitable, healthcare is better. And for those of you that are excited about the humanitarian sector at large, there are the United Nations has sustainable development goals and the SDGs can only be solved when there's connection. Whether you want there to be economic growth, reliable, affordable, clean energy, gender equity, there is, like everything, transportation infrastructure is actually at the root of solving many of these global ills. So Bridges Prosperity, we envision a world where poverty caused by rural isolation no longer exists. And I'm inviting some of you to be part of that movement. Whether you want to be a bridge builder or an engineer or just in the STEM fields at large, we're trying to build a global movement of people that care a lot about sharing our skills and expertise on a global scale. To date, uh, we've actually built, this is a little outdated, sorry. Uh, we've built over 400 bridges uh, across over 20 countries. And every single day we have over a million people walking across these bridges, all because of people like you. People who woke up in the morning and said, I'm gonna build a technical skill and I'm gonna use that technical skill for good. We believe it's really important to say it doesn't just feel good, we think it does good, but to also do research. 
So for many of you, you might actually not want to be an engineer, but you want to be more of a researcher. You want to be in a lab. Well, we partner with researchers at the University of Notre Dame, Yale, Arizona State, and others, University of Colorado Boulder, to set up research studies of really what the impact of infrastructure is. And I can just say it's, it's really impactful and profound. So there's a lot of roles that you can have with the STEM field to help bring attention to the impact that's being helped help for. Our big idea right now, so I want to kind of get some people excited about, is that we're actually solving the problem of rural isolation in the entire country of Rwanda. And I hope you guys understand, this is not Avery flying in and doing it. This is the government of Rwanda with Rwandese engineers, Rwandese managers, Rwandan um, foremen and superintendents and local folks who are going to build that bridge every single day, who are designing and building these structures with the help and the background of our organization. But we hope to scale this globally. I mean, we're currently in our three years out of a five-year program achieving that, um, what we originally thought was an impossible dream. And I think it's kind of interesting for folks who have not spent much time thinking about the continent is that Africa is, is quite, quite large. <laughs> it is not to be thought of singularly. This is not like a, you can think of Africa. Uh, East Africa in its own right is very diverse and is in, larger than the United States. And so Rwanda, located here kind of in the Central East region, is, is one of the smaller countries. And if you can imagine, it's a very hilly and mountainous country, almost like they call it the Switzerland of Africa. It's clean, it's beautiful, it's safe. It's one of the, my favorite countries in the world. But as you get into the more mountainous regions in the West, that's where communities get poorer and poorer and poorer. Because why? It's harder to get places. The rivers are wider, the mountains are bigger, it's harder to get to, to and from commerce. And that happens to be where we are focusing our efforts building the most bridges. So with that, I didn't want to belabor the point too long. I am a structural engineer by training. I could talk to you about all of your designs until we're blue in the face, but I know you guys have all got that in spades. So I just wanted to join you this afternoon or this morning, depending where you are, and hopefully show you a way that STEM fields and engineering in particular can help save lives around the world. Thank you.